Faculty of Latin America, uh, with a joint appointment with the Department of Anthropology in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences here in Harvard University. He got a BA in uh, Western Maryland College, and uh, he got the PhD in University of Chicago. Um, David Carrasco is a Mexican-American historian of religions, with particular interest in Mesoamerican cities as symbols, and the Mexican-American borderlands. He has uh, carried out research in the excavations and archives associated with the site of uh, Teotihuacan and Mexico Tenochtitlan. Some of his most uh, recent collaborative, uh, collaborative publications include Breaking uh, Through Mexico Past, Digging the Aztecs with Eduardo Mac uh, Matos Moctezuma in 2007, Mysteries of the Maya Calendar Museum 2012 with Lana Carrasco, and uh, Cave City and Eagle's Nest, 2007. Uh, and some of his most uh, well-known publications are The Aztecs, a very short introduction published by Oxford University Press in 2012, and The History of the Conquest of New Spain by Bernal Díaz del Castillo in the uh, University of New Mexico Press, 2009. But as I said yesterday, my, um, um, yes, yesterday, Friday, in my introduction to uh, Professor Luis Fernandez y Fuentes, Professor Carrasco profile uh, goes beyond degrees and goes beyond books and publications. He's a big name in Harvard University. Uh, he's an excellent uh, professor. He leads with uh, Professor Maria Luisa Carrasco a successful course about Latino, Latinos, Latinas remaking America. And uh, he's also a member of the steering committee of the uh, Observatory of the Spanish Language and Hispanic Culture in the United States. So he is a friend also of the Observatorio. Thanks, uh, Professor Carrasco, for accepting this uh, invitation today. The title is uh, Mirrors and Windows, and uh, the mic is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much, Paco, for inviting me, especially during the week when Maria Luisa and I are moving from one house to another, <laughs> uh, which is one of the reasons why I haven't been able to be here. Uh, Maria Luisa and I, we do teach a course here together at Harvard, um, and the students uh, have come up with a new name for us and for the course. Uh, instead of calling it Professor Carrasco and Professor Para, they call it Parrasco. <laughs> uh, so the name of the class, and I like the fact that they put Maria Luisa's name first. Uh, so all over the campus, they just talked talk about the course as Parrasco, um, which is the kind of hybridity and the kind of creativity, I think, that uh, Paco very much had in mind when he invited all of us to be part of, um, of this gathering, of this particular gathering. Uh, and one of the ways I want to begin uh, is by send, spending a little time talking about this title. Uh, mirrors and Windows, How New Research Writing Knowledge May Redress Our Fragmentations. Um, uh, and um, as Paco said, I approach this as a Mexican-American, um, uh, which is a little bit different than most of the voices that we've heard so far. Um, and, um, you know, I have identified growing up as a Mexican-American and as a Chicano. It's a name I don't think we've heard much here this week, but it's an important name. It's an important term. And so some of my sensibilities comes from that. Um, and I want to talk about that. I want to weave together what's called existential anthropology, as well as the history of religions or religionswissenschaft, that is the scientific study of religion. I want to weave my own uh, autobiography into this presentation about mirrors and windows. Um, and I, I want to do that uh, in order to um, show you uh, about a center that I created years ago at the University of Colorado uh, and uh, how this uh, was a center that, that involved deep collaboration between a Spaniard, Mexicans, uh, and others. And I created this uh, center called the Moses Mesoamerican Archive. I know that archive has been mentioned a lot here. Luis C. Fuentes gave a fabulous talk yesterday about how to use an archive, how to find new things in an archive. Well, I set up this archive. Uh, and in the story that I'm going to tell, uh, the archive was uh, two things. It was not only a collection of materials, that it was not only a collection of data, but the archive, that term archive, came to mean this group. The archive was a group of people who worked together 
for 35 years. We've worked together for 35 years in an archive. And so when we say archive, we don't just mean the data that's in libraries or in archaeology. We mean this group of people, this community. And that has been, I think, my contribution to uh, Latin American and Latino studies. Uh, it comes out of some ability that I've had to put together teams of people who work together over a long period of time. Uh, and I'm talking about this in part in terms of a kind of crisis that's here at Harvard University. And that crisis is, uh, it's really difficult to get something called Latino studies going. Latino studies, Latina O studies, Latino X studies, Latin plus studies, what is it? It's very hard to get that going at Harvard. Uh, African American studies have been here a long time, been all over the East Coast. But to get Latino studies is going is very difficult. And uh, you know, why is that? As a matter of fact, you could almost say that the best place to do Latino studies on this campus is, is here at the Observatorio. Um, and, and what I'm trying to do to talk today about is how that might take place. And what you need is people who are gonna work together for a long period of time together, as we did here. And you can see us here with these glasses. Uh, these are some of the greatest scholars that came out of Mexico and the United States who studied in uh, Mesoamerican traditions. Uh, here we have a kind of a humorous moment where we're looking through uh, stereophonic gla stereo glasses um, at some research that was done, some photography that took place in the 19th century uh, by Auguste Le Plongeon, who went through the Maya area and took all of these uh, stereo photographs, and they've been recently revived, um, and we were looking at them. Uh, here's Eduardo Matos Moctezuma, uh, probably the, the greatest national treasure of archaeology in the last part of the 20th century in, in Mexico. Henry Nicholson, arguably the, absolutely the greatest person to ever work in the archive in the 20th century uh, about Aztec studies. Charles Long, the great historian of religions. You would think he'd have very little to do with these people, but I brought them uh, together in this case. Here's Edward Kalnick, uh, one of the great ethno-historians uh, who's worked with Robert Bai, uh, probably uh, along with his wife, Edelmila Dinares, who's here, uh, is a great ethno-botanist. We've been working together since 1984. Uh, as a team, as teams, and we meet, and we have developed a way to work together to, to not only do um, uh, interdisciplinary work, but we have committed ourselves to learning something about the other's disciplines. For instance, Anthony Avini is here. Uh, he's the world's leading archaeoastronomer. So all of us learned astronomy, enough astronomy, it's basic astronomy to talk with him. Meanwhile, he learned history of religions from me. We learned art history from others in here. So we created a community, and I'm going to try to share with you, you know, uh, what it was that we have achieved and how it might be helpful uh, in different places in developing long-range communities that really have a chance to work together, in a sense, outside of the usual departmental politics, uh, where people often don't work together. Um, so this is what I, I want to lead us to uh, and talk about the, the mirrors and windows there. But, you know, as an historian of religion, um, you know, I, I grew up in the Methodist Church. Um, and both in the Methodist Church, I find, and in the history of religions, as it was developed as a discipline at the University of Chicago, uh, there is a lot of attention paid, some people would say too much attention is paid, to what's called the prolegomena, to the prologue, you know. And, some people have a title and they just mention the title and then they go on and give the talk. And that's great, that's fine. But at the University of Chicago and in Methodism, there's always a lot of on the prologue. And that is, so that's why I want to talk about my prologue. That is how I approach this, uh, this whole question of uh, Mesoamerican studies, the archive, as an historian of religion. So let me talk a little bit about the meaning of these words for me. That's what I mean by the prologue. What, what are my assumptions about these words mirror? First of all, the mirrors. So the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is, uh, and, and that I pay attention to, is Carlos Fuentes' what I think is a, a great book called The Buried Mirror, Reflections on Spain and the New World. Uh, and it's very interesting when you look at Carlos Fuentes, when he's talking about Spain and the New World, he, he gets this idea of mirror, of, of understanding Spain in the New World, by looking at mirrors, you know, looking at these mirrors, these buried mirrors. And where are the buried mirrors for him? Well, it's at an archaeological site in Mexico called El Tajin. El Tajin and the Pyramid of the Niches. And they found all these, the, these mirrors buried in the ground. You know. He said, why are these people burying these mirrors? 
Why are they taking these mirrors, these obsidian mirrors, and burying them? You know. Well, when you looked into into pre-Columbian mirrors, Aztec mirrors, part of the idea, you know, you looked into them. Like, have you ever seen these? You know, they're not. They're, they're dark. They're very dark. And you look into them, and you can see, you can see something of yourself in the mirror. Absolutely right. But the idea in the mirrors was that when you looked in the mirror, you saw more than yourself. You were looking for some relationship that you had with another. And that other was a deity or a nawal or a spirit that would show up in the mirror. In other words, you were never alone when you looked into the mirror. The idea was you always had relationships with some other beings when you looked into these mirrors. Um, one of the great Aztec gods was called Tezcatlipoca. Uh, it meant, it meant uh, you know, the smoking mirror. And the shamans and the priests, that's the one they would look in the most because it was smoking, it was, you know, something else was happening, there was some movement, something was appearing. And I think Fuentes is sort of getting at that notion here that when you look at the New World, uh, you look at the Mexicans, you look at the Mestizos, you know, there's always a Spaniard in there. There's a Native American in there. And as time went on, there's an African in there. And this is part of what Fuentes is getting at and what I'm getting at when I say, let's look into these mirrors. Um, so when I'm thinking about putting together some sort of research group on Latino studies or working with Paco here, I'm always thinking about these kind of relationships that are in the mirrors. You know, I don't just look at it for mirror, mirror on the wall. You know, <laughs> who's the fairest of them all? And of course, the mirror always gives a bad, bad news uh, <laughs> if you look at it too much and you think it's just you. you know? so, so these mirrors, they can be dangerous things, but they're also revelatory of relationships. So that's one of the things I come at, this notion of the mirror. Now, the second thing that I was thinking of as I was to, trying to think of what I would do for Paco's invitation <laughs> was to, to talk about another person who talks about mirrors. And that's uh, the anthropologist Victor Turner, the great Victor Turner. And Victor Turner you know, there's all this great research, there's ethnography in Africa. And, um, and he got turned on to the ritual processes that people go through in order to, to become new in some way. Um, the rites of passage, how do you, how you get on a path where you get changed. Um, and uh, as his own um, studies went on, he moved toward theater. He moved from ritual studies into the teatro. And he really became interested in those populations, uh, and I will say like the Latino population in this country, or the African American population in this country, of people who had gone through some profound long-term crisis. They had been breached in some way. They had been violated in some way. They had been traumatized in some way. And those traumas stuck with you. They didn't just, you know, you, you didn't just get, you, there was no closure on these traumas. You know, there's, no, there's no closure on the conquest of Mexico. There's no closure on slavery. There's no closure on um, the, the, the Treaty of Guadalupe and all that land going away. There's no closure, he said. So what happens to populations? And he became interested in those populations who created what he called aesthetic mirrors. He said, they, what you do, he said, you, you, you have this crisis and, and what happens is people become organized. They become organized through music. They become organized through studying language. They become organized in some way. And what they're trying to of Latin America, uh, with a joint appointment with the Department of Anthropology in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences here in Harvard University. He got a BA in uh, Western Maryland College and uh, he got the PhD in the University of Chicago. Um, David Carrasco is a Mexican-American historian of religions with particular interest in Mesoamerican cities as symbols and the Mexican-American borderlands. He has a career of research in the excavations and archives associated with the site of uh, Teotihuacan and Mexico Tenochtitlan. Some of his most uh, recent collaborative, uh, collaborative publications include Breaking uh, Through Mexico Past Digging the Aztecs with Eduardo Mac, uh, Matos Moctezuma in 2007, Mysteries of the Maya Calendar Museum 2012 with Lana Carrasco, and uh, Cave City and Eagle's Nest 2007. 
Uh, and some of his most uh, well-known publications are The Aztecs, a very short introduction published by Oxford University Press in 2012, and The History of the Conquest of New Spain by Bernal Díaz del Castillo in the uh, University of New Mexico Press, 2009. But as I said yesterday, in my, um, um, yes, yesterday, Friday, in my introduction to uh, Professor Luis Fernández y Fuentes, Professor Carrasco profile uh, goes beyond degrees and goes beyond books and publications. He's a big name in Harvard University. Uh, he's an excellent uh, professor. He leads with uh, Professor Maria Luisa Carrasco a successful course about Latino, Latinos, Latinas remaking America. And uh, he's also a member of the steering committee of the uh, Observatory of the Spanish Language and Hispanic Culture in the United States. So he's a friend also of the Observatorio. Thanks, uh, Professor Carrasco, for accepting this uh, invitation today. Mm -hmm. The title is uh, Mirrors and Windows, and uh, the mic is yours. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so thank you very much, Paco, for inviting me, especially during the week when Maria Luisa and I are moving from one house to another, <laughs> uh, which is one of the reasons why I haven't been able to be here. Uh, Maria Luisa and I, we do teach a course here together at Harvard um, and the students uh, have come up with a new name for us and for the course. Uh, instead of calling it Professor Carrasco and Professor Parra, they call it Parrasco. Uh, so the name of the class, and I like the fact that they put Maria Luisa's name first. Uh, so all over the campus they just talked talk about the course as Parrasco, um, which is the kind of hybridity and the kind of creativity I think that uh, Paco very much had in mind when he invited all of us to be part of, um, of this gathering, of this particular gathering. Uh, and one of the ways I want to begin uh, is by send, spending a little time talking about this title, uh, Mirrors and Windows, How New Research Writing Knowledge May Redress Our Fragmentations. Um, uh, and. Um, as Paco said, I approach this as a Mexican-American, um, uh, which is a little bit different than most of the voices that we've heard so far. Um, and, um, you know, I have identified growing up as a Mexican-American and as a Chicano. It's a name I don't think we've heard much here this week, but it's an important name. It's an important term. And so some of my sensibilities comes from that. Um, and I want to talk about that. I want to weave together what's called existential anthropology as well as the history of religions or Religionswissenschaft, that is the scientific study of religion. I want to tell, weave my own uh, autobiography into this presentation about mirrors and windows. Um, and I, I want to do that uh, in order to um, show you uh, about a center that I created years ago at the University of Colorado uh, and uh, how this uh, was a center that, that involved deep collaboration between a Spaniard, Mexicans, uh, and others. And I created this uh, center called the Moses Mesoamerican Archive. I know that archive has been mentioned a lot here. Luis Cifuentes gave a fabulous talk yesterday about how to use an archive, how to find new things in an archive. Well, I set up this archive. Uh, and in the story that I'm going to tell, uh, the archive was uh, two things. It was not only a collection of materials, that it was not only a collection of data, but the archive, that term archive, came to mean this group. The archive was a group of people who worked together for 35 years. We've worked together for 35 years in an archive. And so when we say archive, we don't just mean the data that's in libraries or in archaeology. We mean this group of people, this community. And that has been, I think, my contribution to uh, Latin American and Latino studies. Uh, it comes out of some ability that I've had to put together teams of people who work together over a long period of time. Uh, and I'm talking about this in part in terms of a kind of crisis that's here at Harvard University. And that crisis is, uh, it's really difficult to get something called Latino studies going. Latino studies, Latina O studies, Latino X studies, Latin plus studies, what is the, it's very hard to get that going at Harvard. Uh, African American studies have been here a long time, been all over the East Coast, but to get Latino studies is going is very difficult. 
And, uh, you know, why is that? As a matter of fact, you could almost say that the best place to do Latino studies on this campus is, is here at the Observatorio. Um, and, and what I'm trying to do to talk today about is how that might take place. And what you need is people who are going to work together for a long period of time together, as we did here. And you can see us here with these glasses. Uh, these are some of the greatest scholars that came out of Mexico and the United States who've studied in uh, Mesoamerican traditions. Uh, here we have a kind of a humorous moment where we're looking through uh, stereophonic gla stereo glasses um, at some research that was done, some photography that took place in the 19th century uh, by Auguste Le Plongeon, who went through the Maya area and took all of these uh, stereo photographs. And they've been recently revived, um, and we were looking at them. Uh, here's Eduardo Matos Moctezuma, uh, probably the, the greatest national treasure of archaeology in the last part of the 20th century in, in Mexico. Henry Nicholson, arguably the, absolutely the greatest person to ever work in the archive in the 20th century uh, about Aztec studies. Charles Long, the great historian of religions. You would think he'd have very little to do with these people, but I brought them uh, together in this case. Here's Edward Kalnick, uh, one of the great ethno-historians uh, who's worked with Robert Bai, uh, probably uh, along with his wife, Edelmila Nidnares, who's here, uh, is a great ethnobotanist. We've been working together since 1984. Uh, as a team, as teams, and we meet, and we have developed a way to work together to, to not only do um, uh, interdisciplinary work, but we have committed ourselves to learning something about the other's disciplines. For instance, Anthony Avini is here. Uh, he's the world's leading archaeoastronomer. So all of us learned astronomy, enough astronomy, it's basic astronomy to talk with him. Meanwhile, he learned history of religions from me. We learned art history from others in here. So we created a community, and I'm going to try to share with you, you know, uh, what it was that we have uh, achieved and how it might be helpful uh, in different places in developing long-range communities that really have a chance to work together, in a sense, outside of the usual departmental politics, uh, where people often don't work together. Um, so this is what I, I want to lead us to uh, and talk about the, the mirrors and windows there. But, you know, as an historian of religion, um, you know, I, I, I grew up in the Methodist Church. Um, and both in the Methodist Church, I find, and in the history of religions, as it was developed as a discipline at the University of Chicago, uh, there is a lot of attention paid, some people would say too much attention is paid, to what's called the prolegomena, to the prologue, you know. And, some people have a title and they just mention the title and then they go on and give the talk. And that's great, that's fine. But at the University of Chicago and in Methodism, there's always a lot of on the prologue. And that is, so that's why I want to talk about my prologue. That is how I approach this, uh, this whole question of uh, Mesoamerican studies, the archive, as an historian of religion. So let me talk a little bit about the meaning of these words for me. That's what I mean by the prologue. What, what are my assumptions about these words mirror? First of all, the mirrors. So the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is, uh, and, and I pay attention to, is Carlos Fuentes' what I think is a, a great book called The Buried Mirror, Reflections on Spain and the New World. Uh, and it's very interesting when you look at Carlos Fuentes, when he's talking about Spain and the New World, he, he gets this idea of mirror, of, of understanding Spain in the New World, by looking at mirrors, you know, looking at these mirrors, these buried mirrors. And where are the buried mirrors for him? Well, it's at an archaeological site in Mexico called El Tajin. El Tajin and the Pyramid of the Niches. And they found all these, the, these mirrors buried in the ground. You know. He said, why are these people burying these mirrors? Why are they taking these mirrors, these obsidian mirrors, and burying them? You know? Well, when you looked into, into pre-Columbian mirrors, Aztec mirrors, part of the idea, you, know, you looked into them, like, if you've ever seen these, you know, they're, not, they're, they're dark, they're very dark. And you look into them and you can, see, you can see something of yourself in the mirror. Absolutely right. But the idea of the mirrors was that when you looked in the mirror, you saw more than yourself. You were looking for some relationship that you had with another. And that other was a deity or a nawal or a spirit that would show up in the mirror. In other words, you were never alone when you looked into the mirror. The idea was you always had relationships with some other beings when you looked into these mirrors. Um, one of the great Aztec gods was called Tezcatlipoca. Uh, it meant, it meant uh, you know, the smoking mirror. 
And the shamans and the priests, that's the one they would look in the most. Because it was smoking, it was, you know, something else was happening, there was some movement, something was appearing. And I think Fuentes is sort of getting at that notion here, that when you look at the New World, uh, you look at the Mexicans, you look at the Mestizos, you know, there's always a Spaniard in there. There's a Native American in there. And as time went on, there's an African in there. And this is part of what Fuentes is getting at and what I'm getting at when I say, let's look into these mirrors. Um, so when I'm thinking about putting together some sort of research group on Latino studies or working with Paco here, I'm always thinking about these kind of relationships that are in the mirrors. You know, I don't just look at it from mirror, mirror on the wall. You know, <laughs> who's the fairest of them all? And of course, the mirror always gives a bad, bad news uh, <laughs> if you look at it too much and you think it's just you. you know? so, so these mirrors, they can be dangerous things, but they're also revelatory of relationships. So that's one of the things I come at, this notion of the mirror. Now, the second thing that I was thinking of as I was to, trying to think of what I would do for Paco's invitation <laughs> was to, to talk about another person who talks about mirrors. And that's uh, the anthropologist Victor Turner, the great Victor Turner. And Victor Turner, you know, there's all this great research, there's ethnography in Africa. And, um, and he got turned on to the ritual processes that people go through in order to, to become new in some way. Um, the rites of passage, how do you, how you get on a path where you get changed. Um, and uh, as his own um, studies went on, he moved toward theater. He moved from ritual studies into the teatro. And he really became interested in those populations. Uh, and I will say like the Latino population in this country or the African-American population in this country of people who had gone through some profound long-term crisis. They had been breached in some way. They had been violated in some way. They had been traumatized in some way. And those traumas stuck with you. They didn't just, you know, you, you didn't just get, you know, there was no closure on these traumas. You know, there's no, there's no closure on the conquest of Mexico. There's no closure on slavery. There's no closure on um, the, the, the Treaty of Guadalupe and all that land going away. There's no closure, he says. So what happens to populations? And he became interested in those populations who created what he called aesthetic mirrors. He said, they, what you do, he said, you, you, you have this crisis and, and what happens is people become organized. They become organized through music. They become organized through studying language. They become organized in some way. And what they're trying to do, who've been through these traumatic experiences, is they're trying to come up with redressive moves, redressive actions. Some way, how do you redress the crisis? The, how you redress the trauma? How you deal with that trauma? And he said, you, what, what people do, and I'm saying that what Latin Americans do, is they create these aesthetic mirrors. You know, or if you, uh, you know, looking at uh, Luis y Fuentes' talk about what's going on in Spain and why they choose an Ecuadorian painter. Well, because some, at some level he'd say they see it as an aesthetic mirror where they, they, they create these things that they look into, but they also try to show the rest of the people and say, look, this is what's happened to you. And this is a way you can create some sort of beauty in drama where you show the trauma and you also suggest some kind of healing process. Now, it doesn't mean it heals you, but you suggest the healing process. So what Victor Turner said was these aesthetic mirrors, you know, the, some of the music, some of the dancing, you know, I mean, uh, we had a student come in our class, in the Parrasco class, and he, uh, you know, I forget which song he played at the beginning, but it was a, a song about terrible pain uh, in, the, in the Mexican community, but it was something you danced to. And you feel good about dancing to this pain. I call it politics you can dance to. And he said, it's the way Latins put tragedy and some sort of, some sort of redressive action in their music. You know, the, the content is awful, but the style is really wonderful, man. And so it's that kind of redressive action. So I was thinking about that, a second way of thinking about this idea of mirrors and how we ought to approach kind of this kind of studies here you know, at, at Harvard. So I'll come back to that, but I just wanted to mention that. The second term, of course, uh, in, um, in my, my talk is the idea of windows. And Maria Luisa and I went to see this exhibition some time ago called Rooms with a View, the open window in the 19th century. 
Um, and this is another way in which I, I approach the topic, this idea of, of the open window. This, in this case, a woman is standing uh, at this, this window. Now, um, rooms with a view, uh, the open window in the 19th century, uh, was an exhibition about unfulfilled longing, luminosity, and interiority. But it, it picked up the romantic motif of the open window in order to emphasize what it means to stand at a threshold between the inside and the outside. Between the understanding of the inside, not only the inside of the house, but the inside of a person, the inside of a culture, the inside of a language, but also the outside of the place, the outside of the person, the outside of the language. It's about the interior and the exterior world standing at the threshold. And so I would like to think about this in terms of so the Latino thing, the Latin, Latin American thing, the observatorio thing here in Boston, outside of Spain, here looking out, you know. Um, and uh, this is the other way I was thinking about this notion uh, of the windows. Now, uh, as you can probably suggest, I, you know, as, as a scholar, and maybe growing up in that Methodist church where there was always a long prolegomena before they gave the sermon, all kinds of things are happening before you actually have the mass. You know, um, and that is, I was trained somewhat in the Romantic tradition. I like the Romantic tradition not only because of the idealism of the Romantic tradition, but because some of these people who I met were trying to be very critical about injustices in society. This is what attracted me to the Romantic poets. Not just that they, you know, had these ideals, but they also, many of them were really interested in social change and were trying to critique situations. So this is what I'm thinking of when I use windows and mirrors, some of this, this kind of, of stuff. And so the, the windows for me represents a kind of movement. And when you approach a window, you know, the vista gets wider and more light comes in. And I translate this into the notion of multidisciplinarity. The multidisciplinarity, that is you get the multidisciplinarity together and you spend time learning each other's stuff. You know, I mean, I left yesterday wanting to not only listen to Luis, but to, to learn about how he does. And if we were to spend time over five years, that's what I'd do. I'd spend time not just telling him what I know, but learning how he works in the, in the archive. I think that's what we need to do, right? The third thing I want to mention is over here on the board in terms of this method that I use uh, when I do this is, this is, a, this is an idea that, that I got from uh, a man named David Hawkins. David Hawkins was one of the first people to, to win a MacArthur Genius Award. Uh, and at the time, I think he was in his 70s. And he, was a, he and his wife were, were educational philosophers. They were philosophers of education. And they were really dealing about children's education. And one of the things they said about children's education is, you know, you had to get away from the educational, the learning model of the I and the thou. You got the I and the thou. So you got the teacher and the student, the teacher and the child. And so you have this nice relationship between the I and the thou. Uh, and you, uh, you know, you, basically what you're trying to do is to get the child to, to learn what you're going to teach them and so forth and so on. And they, they came up with this idea called the I, thou, and the it. Now most of us don't like the notion of a it. You don't want to call it. But what the it was, the it becomes, you know, the material, the text, the language, whatever, that the, that the two of you interact around. In other words, this isn't the direction of a learning. It's really around this. It's how you interact with this, this idea of this it, these texts. Um, and it helps the students. Uh, I learned in this course, I taught this semester on, uh, with David Yahweh on Garcia Marquez and Toni Morrison, that it, it gets them away from trying to figure out, well, what does Carrasco want us to learn? Now, it's not what Carrasco wants you to learn. It's what you're going to do with, with Garcia Marquez and Toni Morrison. However, as you'll see, as time went on, I began to feel, because of my own interests and my own experiences, that this it becomes a thou. I mean, it becomes a thou in literature. Literature, to me, when you, it was very interesting in your presentation. You know, as time has gone on, these, these literary texts, and if you, you know if you read them, they're alive. They're not just alive on the page. They're alive in your mind. It's what Melchiades says at the beginning of, 
hundred years of solitude when he comes through town and he's got those ingots, he's got those magnets and he's bringing those magnets along. And all these things start to appear underneath beds and the screws start coming out of the walls and he says, everything has a life of its own. It's just a matter of waking up its soul. Well, you know, I think archeology span has soul. I think the art that we saw the other day, it has soul. I don't think it's just, you know, there to be analyzed in a social scientific way, it is. But my experience of these things is that they're alive too, just like in that mirror. Just like in that mirror. So this is part of my prolegomena. This is kind of the way, uh, which may, some people may find strange, that I come at whatever we, we do, you know, uh, in this situation. So let me tell you now some, how I get to this archive, how my archive got created, okay? First of all, what I call my Aztec moments. So you heard me talk about this. When I was 13 years old, I went to live in Mexico City. My father had been invited by the Confederación Deportiva Mexicana to help train Mexican coaches in preparation for the Olympic Games. Um, and uh, so we went to live there in Mexico City. Uh, and it just blew my mind, it blew my mind. And uh, my aunt, uh, Milena, took me one day down to the Zocalo. Um, where at that time the archaeology museum was. The archaeology museum was right down the street on Moneda Street. Um, and uh, here I am, 13 years old. I grew up in the United States, mostly on the East Coast. Um, and um, uh, I went into that museum uh, and I saw fabulous things. I saw, for the first time, I saw the calendar stone. I saw codices with Aztec goddesses. I saw Maya masks. Uh, you know, I saw I saw this kind of stuff, and you know, that started to make me shiver. I mean, it was really a fabulous experience for me, but it scared me a little bit, scared me. And as a matter of fact, I was so impressed and moved by, you know, because it had soul. <laughs> it, to me, it woke up, and it woke me up. And so I remember, even as a 13-year-old, going out into the Zocalo afterward and, and feeling an identity crisis, what people came in the 70s called an identity crisis. I was having it right there in the Zocalo. Because on the one hand, what, what came to the surface of my awareness was how much in the US I had been taught and in a sense brainwashed to think of civilization and empire and all the, the good stuff that came with it to be from Rome. It came from the Greeks. I mean, it was interesting that building you showed uh, yesterday that uh, uh, you know, was a copy. Of, you know, it had, this, had Rome in it. Rome is there. As a matter of fact, if you read, uh, if you read Bernard Diaz del Castillo, as I have, if you read uh, Las Casas, as I have, if you read Cortez, they're always talking about Rome, you know, and Greece and all that stuff. And so you grew up in this country at that time, you're thinking, where is civilization? Where are the really cultivated people? Well, they're not in Mexico. They're not in Peru. No one ever made us think that. As a matter of fact, it's Moctezuma's revenge was the jokes you heard. And, uh, there was a song we learned as kids in this country. It was the Marine Fight Song. From the hulls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. You know, we, we gringos, we fight and we win. That's what you grew up with in this, in this country, even if you had grandmothers and family giving you some affirmation. So I was there, on the one hand, I became aware, man, you know, <laughs> I had been taught to be kind of ashamed of this side of things. But at the same time, in my chest, I felt that day pushing back something else, and what was pushing back was a sense of, hold on, there's really something marvelous here. There's something, some deep stuff here. There's something to be proud of. There's something to be curious about. There's something to, to know about the civilizations and the peoples here. And from the time I was 13 until now, you know, I've been looking at this because of that day, my Aztec moment. I, re I, didn't, I realized not that I was an Aztec, you know, so you have senior moments, you forget stuff. This was an Aztec moment where I discovered something. It said, I really was not black or white. And I grew up with black people. You know, but you have that line. In fact, that line is still here at Harvard. It's the most powerful line on campus, that you're black or white. And it's getting more powerful. My, my good friend Cornell West is coming, so it's going to be more powerful. And I realized I'm not either one of those. I'm a mixture of all this stuff, and that's got to be figured out, what it means to be a mixture, what it means to have this kind of confusion, this kind of opportunities. And so what happened to me that day was my Aztec moment taught me that, you know, there was really something to be understood here. 
to be understood along with the Romans and the Greeks and the Egyptians and the Chinese. You know? And so that became a big part of it. Now, how did I come to be involved in this? Well, it became through a Spaniard. I never told Paco about this. You know, as a result of the Spanish Civil War, as you know, many people came to Mexico. And one of the great Mexican artists at the time, he was young, he never achieved great prominence in Spain, was Pedro Armias. And Pedro Armias uh, was wounded in the Spanish Civil War, fighting for the side we like. Uh, matter of fact, he had this incredible, he had this incredible limp. When Pedro Armias came in the room, it was like this, man, from this boom he had. And it would, became something uh, quite attractive about him. You know? And so Pedro Armias uh, came to Mexico, and he happened to be discovered by the great Mexican archaeologist Alfonso Caso. At that time, was uh, you know beginning to excavate in the in, in the area of Monte Alban and the great um, tombs of Monte Alban, and they needed somebody to make maps. And he knew how to be a surveyor because during the Spanish Civil War, he had been an artillery captain, having to figure out you know the you know, the angle of things. And so he knew all about that. Uh, and he became the map maker for some, the, for the heyday of Mexican archaeology. Um, now, Armias was a materialist, a Marxist. And as time went on and he became a very prominent teacher in Mexico, this Spaniard, Armias, came into conflict with some of the other Mexican archaeologists around the issue of Marxism, about how much you should push Marxism in the study of pre-Columbian society. Um, and in a public moment in Mexico, Armias and this great Caso had a public argument. And as a result of that public argument, Armias had to leave. Trying to do, who've been through these traumatic experiences, is they're trying to come up with redressive moves, redressive actions. Some way how you redress the crisis, the, how you redress the trauma, how you deal with that trauma. And he says, you, what, what people do, and I'm saying that what Latin Americans do is they create these aesthetic mirrors, you know. Or if you, uh, you know, looking at uh, Luis Cifuentes' talk about what's going on in Spain and why they choose an Ecuadorian painter. Well, because some, at some level he'd say they see it as an aesthetic mirror where they, they, they create these things that they look into, but they also try to show the rest of the people and say, look, this is what's happened to you. And this is a way you can create some sort of beauty in drama where you show the trauma and you also suggest some kind of healing process. Now, it doesn't mean it heals you, but you suggest the healing process. So what Victor Turner said was these aesthetic mirrors, you know, the, some of the music, some of the dancing, you know, I mean, uh, we had a student come in our class, in the Parrasco class, and he, uh, you know, I forget which song he played at the beginning, but it was a, a song about terrible pain uh, in, the, in the Mexican community, but it was something you danced to. And you feel good about dancing to this pain. I call it politics you can dance to. And he said, it's the way Latins put tragedy and some sort of, some sort of redressive action in their music. You know, the, the content is awful, but the style is really wonderful, man. And so it's that kind of redressive action. So I was thinking about that, a second way of thinking about this idea of mirrors and how we ought to approach kind of this kind of studies here you know, at, at Harvard. So I'll come back to that, but I just wanted to mention that. The second term, of course, uh, in, um, in my, my talk is the idea of windows. And Maria Luisa and I went to see this exhibition some time ago called Rooms with a View, the open window in the 19th century. Um, and this is another way in which I, I approach the topic, this idea of, of the open window. This, in this case, a woman is standing uh, at this, this window. Now, um, rooms with a view, uh, the open window in the 19th century, uh, was an exhibition about unfulfilled longing, luminosity, and interiority. But it, it picked up the romantic motif of the open window in order to emphasize what it means to stand at a threshold between the inside and the outside, between the understanding of the inside, not only the inside of the house, but the inside of a person, the inside of a culture, the inside of a language, but also the outside of the place, the outside of the person, the outside of the language. It's about the interior and the exterior world standing at the threshold. And so I'd like to think about this 
in terms of so the Latino thing, the Latin Latin American thing, the Observatorio thing here in Boston, outside of Spain, here looking out, you know. Um, and uh, this is the other way I was thinking about this notion uh, of the windows. Now, uh, as you can probably suggest, I, you know, as, as a scholar, and maybe growing up in that Methodist church where there was always a long prolegomena before they gave the sermon, all kinds of things are happening before you actually have the mass. You know, um, and that is, I was trained somewhat in the Romantic tradition. I like the Romantic tradition not only because of the idealism of the Romantic tradition, but because some of these people who are, were trying to be very critical about injustices in society. This is what att attracted me to the Romantic poets. Not just that they, you know, had these ideals, but they also, many of them were really interested in social change and were trying to critique situations. So this is what I'm thinking of when I use windows and mirrors, some of this, this kind of, of stuff. And so the, the windows for me represents a kind of movement. And when you approach a window, you know, the vista gets wider and more light comes in. And I translate this into the notion of multidisciplinarity. The multidisciplinarity, that is you get the multidisciplinarity together and you spend time learning each other's stuff. You know, I mean, I left yesterday wanting to not only listen to Luis, but to, to learn about how he does. And if we were to spend time over five years, that's what I'd do. I'd spend time not just telling him what I know, but learning how he works in the, in the archive. I think that's what we need to do, right? The third thing I want to mention it's over here on the board in terms of this method that I use uh, when I do this is this is a this is an idea that that I got from uh, a man named David Hawkins. David Hawkins was one of the first people to to win a MacArthur Genius Award uh, and at the time I think he was in his 70s and he was a, he and his wife were, were educational philosophers they were philosophers of education and they're really dealing about children's education and one of the things they said about children's education is you know, you had to get away from the educational, the learning model of the I and the thou. You got the I and the thou. So you got the teacher and the student, the teacher and the child. And so you have this nice relationship between the I and the thou. Uh, and you, uh, you know, you basically what you're trying to do is to get the child to, to learn what you're going to teach them and so forth and so on. And they, they came up with this idea called the I, thou, and the it. Now most of us don't like the notion of a it. You don't want to call it. But what the it was, the it becomes, you know, the material, the text, the language, whatever, that the, that the two of you interact around. In other words, this isn't the direction of our learning. It's really around this. It's how you interact with this, this idea of this it, these texts. Um, and it helps the students. Uh, I learned in this course I taught this semester on, uh, with David Yahweh on Garcia Marquez and Tony Morrison, that it, it gets them away from trying to figure out, well, what does Carrasco want us to learn? Now, it's not what Carrasco wants you to learn. It's what you're going to do with, with Garcia Marquez and Toni Morrison. However, as you'll see, as time went on, I began to feel, because of my own interests and my own experiences, that this it becomes a thou. I mean, it becomes a thou in literature. Literature, to me, when you, it was very interesting, your presentation, you know, as time has gone on, these, these literary texts, and if you, you know if you read them, but they're alive. They're not just alive on the page. They're alive in your mind. It's what Melchiades says at the beginning of 100 Years of Solitude when he comes through town and he's got those ingots, he's got those magnets, and he's bringing those magnets along. And all these things start to appear underneath beds and the screws start coming out of the walls. And he says, everything has a life of its own. It's just a matter of waking up its soul. Well, you know, I think archaeology has soul. I think the art that we saw the other day it has soul. I don't think it's just, you know, there to be analyzed in a social scientific way. It is. But my experience of these things is that they're alive too, just like in that mirror. Just like in that mirror. So this is part of my prolegomena. This is kind of the way, uh, which may, some people may find strange, that I come at whatever we, we do, you know, uh, in this situation. So. Let me tell you now some, how I get to this archive, how my archive got created, okay? 
truth of what I call my Aztec moment. Some of you heard me talk about this. When I was 13 years old, I went to live in Mexico City. My father had been invited by the Confederación Deportiva Mexicana to help train Mexican coaches in preparation for the Olympic Games. Um, and uh, so we went to live there in Mexico City. Uh, and it just blew my mind, it blew my mind. And uh, my aunt, uh, Milena, took me one day down to the Zocalo, um, where at that time the archaeology museum was. The archaeology museum was right down the street on Moneda Street. Um, and uh, here I am, 13 years old. I grew up in the United States, mostly on the East Coast. Um, and um, uh, I went into that museum uh, and I saw fabulous things. I saw, for the first time, I saw the calendar stone. I saw codices with Aztec goddesses. I saw Maya masks. Uh, you know, I saw, I saw this kind of stuff, and you know, that started to make me shiver. I mean, it was really a fabulous experience for me, but it scared me a little bit, scared me. And as a matter of fact, I was so impressed and moved by, you know, because it had soul. <laughs> it, to me, it woke up, and it woke me up. And so I remember, even as a 13-year-old, uh, going out into the Zocalo afterward, and, and feeling an identity crisis, what people came in the 70s called an identity crisis. And I was having it right there in the Zocalo. Because on the one hand, what, what came to the surface of my awareness was how much in the U.S. I had been taught and, in a sense, brainwashed to think of civilization and empire and all the good stuff that came with it to be from Rome. It came from the Greeks. I mean, it was interesting that building you showed uh, yesterday that, uh, uh, you know, was a copy. Of, you know, it had, this, it had Rome in it. Rome is there. Matter of fact, if you read, uh, if you read Bernal Diaz del Castillo, as I have, if you read uh, Las Casas, as I have, if you read Cortez, they're always talking about Rome, you know, and Greece and all that stuff. And so you grew up in this country at that time, you're thinking, where is civilization? Where are the really cultivated people? Well, they're not in Mexico. They're not in Peru. No one ever made us think that. As a matter of fact, it's Moctezuma's revenge was the jokes you heard. And, uh, there was a song we learned as kids in this country. It was the Marine Fight Song. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. You know, we, we gringos, we fight and we win. That's what you grew up with in this, in this country, even if you had grandmothers and family giving you some affirmation. So I was there, on the one hand, I became aware, man, you know, <laughs> I had been taught to be kind of ashamed of this side of things. But at the same time, in my chest, I felt that day pushing back something else, and what was pushing back was a sense of, hold on, there's really something marvelous here. There's something, some deep stuff here. There's something to be proud of. There's something to be curious about. There's something to, to know about the civilizations and the peoples here. And from the time I was 13 until now, you know, I've been looking at this because of that day, my Aztec moment. I, re I, didn't, I realized not that I was an Aztec, you know, so you have senior moments, you forget stuff. This was an Aztec moment where I discovered something. It said, I really was not black or white. And I grew up with black people. You know, when you have that line. In fact, that line is still here at Harvard. It's the most powerful line on campus, that you're black or white. And it's getting more powerful. My, my good friend Cornell West is coming, so it's going to be more powerful. And I realized I'm not either one of those. I'm a mixture of all this stuff, and that's got to be figured out, what it means to be a mixture, what it means to have this kind of confusion, this kind of opportunities. And so what happened to me that day was my Aztec moment taught me that, you know, there was really something to be understood here, to be understood along with the Romans and the Greeks and the Egyptians and the Chinese, you know. And so that became a big part of it. Now, how did I come to be involved in this? Well, it became through a Spaniard. I never told Paco about this. You know, as a result of the Spanish Civil War, as you know, many people came to Mexico. And one of the great Mexican artists at the time, he was young, he never achieved great prominence in Spain, was Pedro Armias. And Pedro Armias uh, was wounded in the Spanish Civil War, fighting for the side we like. Uh, matter of fact, he had this incredible, he had this incredible limp. When Pedro Martínez came in the room, it was like this, man, come this boom he had. And it would, became something uh, quite attractive about him, you know. And so Pedro Armías uh, came to Mexico, and he happened to be discovered by the great Mexican archaeologist Alfonso Caso. At that time, was, uh, you know, beginning to excavate in the, 
in the area of Monte Alban and the great um, tombs of Monte Alban. And they needed somebody to make maps. And he knew how to be a surveyor because during the Spanish Civil War, he had been an artillery captain, having to figure out you know, the, you know, the angle of things. And so he knew all about that. Uh, and he became the map maker for some the, sort of the heyday of Mexican archaeology. Um, now, Armenius was a materialist, a Marxist, and as time went on and he became a very prominent teacher in Mexico, this Spaniard, Armenius, came into conflict with some of the other Mexican archaeologists around the issue of Marxism, about how much you should push Marxism in the study of pre-Columbian society. Um, and in a public moment in Mexico, Armenius and this great Caso had a public argument. And as a result of that public argument, Armias had to leave Mexico. He could no longer work in Mexico. He came to the University of Illinois. Well, I didn't know anything about this part, but as I was going through my doctoral stuff, you read stuff written by Mexicans, and they always talked about this guy, Armias, what he had done, and how much he had understood so much of the rise of Mesoamerican civilization. Well, look, I found I heard by accident that he was at the University of Illinois. So I, I got on the phone because I needed somebody to tutor me. And I said, hey, I'm sorry, David Carrasco. Can you know what he said? Are you, in this deep voice, are you related to Pedro Carrasco? And I said, no, no, I, I know him, but I'm not, you know, I'm, not, I'm not related to Pedro Carrasco. He was another famous Mesoamerican. So I went over and I persuaded him to tutor me. So we became, he, I used to go to his house all the time. He would tutor me. You know, Chicago had nobody working in Mesoamerica, Aztec civilization, because okay? they still had not been deprovincialized. What happened was I needed to go back to Mexico to do some research, and he wrote a letter to the up-and-coming Eduardo Matos Moctezuma, who had been his student. And I took this letter with me. I took this letter down, and I met Matos, and he read those, mm, how come this big Chicano is showing up with a letter from the great Armias, you know, and so forth. So he gave me permission to go work at these archaeological zones, Teotihuacan, Tula, and so forth, and to go spend the night there. I wanted to see what it was like, because of my romantic, what it's like at night at these archaeological zones. I'll tell you, muchos moscos, the mosquitoes ate me up, and I'll tell you. So, so what happened was, he, he introduced me to Eduardo Matos. It was just a short meeting. And this is Eduardo Matos as a young archaeologist. So here you see him in Chiapas, and he's, you know, he's directing these workers, they're bringing this monument and so forth. So a Spaniard takes me to Mexico, um, and what happens is, uh, in 1978, there's this fabulous discovery in downtown Mexico City. I mean, it's a world-shaking discovery. Uh, and as a result of this discovery uh, of the great Coyoshalki stone, they begin to excavate the great Aztec temple, which is the equivalent of the Vatican of, of the Aztec world. Eduardo Matos is put in charge of it. He put in charge of the excavation. And as a result of his managing this excavation of the very center of the Aztec world, uh, he becomes a national treasure. You go to Mexico today, and you just, all my cab rides are free because I just tell them I'm going to see Matos. And they say, Matos, oh no, we're going to give you a free cab ride. Um, because this is very interesting in terms of this point. One cab driver said to me about Matos, he showed us Mexicans who we are. Now, what I'm trying to say is this is the kind of power that uh, this archaeology had in Mexico you know, at the time. So what, what happened? Here's what happened. And so uh, they, they discovered in 1978 right here in the road, underneath the road, behind the National Cathedral, they, they discover uh, the Coyoshauki stone. And here you see them, you see how the road curves? Because it's on top of an Aztec pyramid. And if you go over a, if you go over a, a block, it's the same thing. See how it's curved? And right there, and the, the electrical workers were putting lines underneath here, and they find this incredible, incredible Aztec monument. Talk about civilization, you know. Here it is. They find this thing, it's 12 feet across, and it's a dismembered goddess, beautifully carved, but encapsulated in this way. Here's her head, and so forth, just to give you a sense of the size of this thing. This is the size of, of what was found there. Um, and, um, you know, it was, on, it was on Walter Cronkite, it was all over the world, everybody knew about this, because, so I'm back in Mexico now, I'm back, and I become a part of this. Um, I'm back into this whole thing, back in the Zocalo. Uh, and here you see, um, you know, the blood flowing from the body of this, uh, of this, uh, of this great figure. 
And Eduardo Matos is put in charge of it. And so what happens is I go back to Mexico, I uh, living with my same aunt. She says, you go down and see Matos. I said, he's not going to remember me. He said, oh no, he'll remember. You go down and see him. So I go down to the excavation. I'm standing at the fence, five deep. All the Mexicans are looking in because this is incredible news. They're finding all this material, this incredible stuff. And there's Matos. And I wanted to shout over the, hey, Matos, David Carrasco, you remember me? You know, and I, but I'm not going to do it because it's going to embarrass him. And if he says no, poof, it's all gone, see? So I, and I had this feeling, I had this feeling that, man, this is a moment for me. I'm at the University of Chicago. I'm writing about cities and symbols and Quetzalcoatl and the way religion plays. And here they found this thing in Mexico City. And so I got to get Matos' attention to see if he remembers me. It's now three years later. But I'm not going to yell over the fence because if it embarrasses him and he's going to say, well, can this thing? This thing is the pocho que está por aquí, no? So, uh, no. So I went around. I looked around for a way to get his attention. I went around the back of the excavation area. And there in the back, there were these trees. And these trees had these little guardias on. They had these little guardrails. I got up and <laughs> looked over the fence. And there's Matos right there where Luis is, right there. He's that close. I said, oh, man, now I can maybe get his attention. Maybe he'll remember me. You know, without embarrassing him, he's showing somebody the site. Just at that moment, over there, right just down there, you know, past where Paco is, somebody, for some reason they opened the gate. I don't know why they opened the gate. I ran down and I stood in the middle and I said, Eduardo, David Carrasco, no sé si me recuerdas. He said, David, I've been waiting for you. Come on in. He says, you know, I said, wow. He said, look, can you come back uh, Monday, 10 o'clock, because I want to talk to you about how we can work together in the future of this. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm free on Monday. I'm free on Monday. And even though you no soy católico, I went over to the National Cathedral to thank the Virgen de Guadalupe, you know, forever. I said, I'll do anything you say for this opportunity. <laughs> so what happens is this becomes this moment of transition. Now you see the National Cathedral, here's the excavation, um, where Matos says to me, David, I want you to help me organize the future studies on the Eight Great Aztec Temple because I get calls all the time from these Chicanos who think that this somehow has something to do with them. They think Aslan is in Arizona. He said, we know, you know Aslan is you know, no, no further north than San Luis Potosi, but you know, maybe you can help us understand this. I want to know about the Mexican-Americans and why they identify so much with this. So we begin a partnership, Eduardo Matos and I begin a partnership to begin to organize an international group of scholars to study this, you know, this ghost. Here's where the great temple stood in relationship to Mexico City. So you see, as a kid, I'm over here in the Zocalo worrying about my identity. Here I am now invited to be a part of this uh, particular experience. So um, this Spaniard leads me to Matos, which leads me uh, to uh, this, this partnership. And, and what happens then is the formation of this research center, which is sort of my model Here's a picture. I just took it last year, just last year, me and Matos. Uh, um, and so what, what takes place then is he says, he, he and I come up with the following agreement. That we're going to form a long-term research center that's going to be multidisciplinary. And it's going to help us train students. And it's going to help us use these different disciplines to figure out what in the world the Aztecs were achieving in the creation of this empire that was based not only on religiosity, on violence and sexuality, very much like the Spanish empire that comes. Um, and we're going to create a new body of knowledge, but we're going to do it in such a way that it achieves a couple of good goals. So we had six things in mind, but one of the purposes of, of this, uh, and Paco's going to help me uh, set up uh, this, uh, the website I want you to see. One of the things that, that Matos and I said clearly was, look, David, he said, David, you know, the gringos in the United States have too much control over these studies. So what you and I are going to do as a Mexican-American, as a Mexican, we're going to get control of the way these studies are done in the United States, or we're going to influence how these studies are done in the United States. He said, because I want to work with you as a Mexican-American, and I want to make sure that the Mexican and the Mexican-American really direct how Aztec studies are done in the future. Um, and we created the archive. And the archive has seven major points. And I'm going to go through them quickly, and then we can have some discussion. 
So the first thing that we had to do was we wanted to create a collection of the it, the data, the images, and the texts, and the stories. And we had to create them, uh, this organization of them, and put them in a central location. And the central location was going to be where I was, which was the University of Colorado in Boulder at the time. Now, when they excavated the Great Aztec Temple, which still, by the way, is still going on, there was all this fabulous photograph photography was done. I mean, the National Geographic did a cover story on it. Uh, Time Magazine did a big story on it. And all these great photo photographers came down and took photographs, which the Mexicans then got control of, but they gave me a copy. So I would have a backup copy of all these photographs in case something happened to the archive in Mexico. That copy is here now at Harvard with me. I've had it with me for 30 years. When I was at Colorado, when I went to Princeton, and here, I have the backup copy for what's in Mexico in case something were to happen to it. We also you know, collected all this, not only the pictorial material, but we then collected the best scholarship we could get in articles and in books. Uh, um, uh, and that became, I can tell you, a very potent collection because when Princeton came and recruited me, I said, well, I got me an archive and I'm not going anywhere without my archive. And they said, oh no, we want you because of the archive. <laughs> and so the archive went to Princeton with me and we set up a, and it grew and grew. When Harvard came, they said, well, we want you because of the archive. So the archive is here now. The second thing, you know, was, you know, I had gone, it was so good about what Paco's done here, I had gone to these professional meetings, the American Academy of Religion, and I grew to detest them because it'd be 3,000 people, and you go and you get in a room, and you stand up for 20 minutes and give a talk and sit down. Somebody else doesn't, then they'll go off and that's it. Maybe you have lunch. And I thought, man, this is a waste of time. I mean, this is okay, but you know, we're gonna have our own meetings. So we organized a group of meetings and each meeting would last a whole week. I would fly people from Mexico and from the US, sometimes from Japan to Boulder, Colorado, and we would stay for a week together and we would work. And people would have a whole morning to make your presentation. You'd make your presentation, there'd be a discussion, and then you'd do the next one, and people began to form really working relationships. We did this throughout, starting in 79. We did it at Colorado until I left in 92. Then when I went to Princeton, we did the same thing until I came here in 2001. And we had these meetings where people really got to spend time together. And that became that became really, let me get this thing here. <coughs> that became the archive. Let me show you some of the stuff in the people here. Yeah, here, here's a group of, of some of the people meeting uh, in Princeton. Um, we did some stuff here with Day of the Dead. Here we are on a field trip in Mexico. So one of the things that we did, we would take people also to Mexico. Here we are with a Nahuatl speaking family, it's still very Aztec, <coughs> who is teaching us about the cultivation of mezcal uh, and the cult cultivation of these materials. Because uh, in our group, we had ethnobotanists. And these ethnobotanists knew how today in Mexico, the Aztec ethnobotany was still being carried on. So we also took uh, uh, people there. Um, what we decided we would do, and this is you know, the third point, the third point which is significant for me, and, and again, it was resonating with Luis's talk yesterday. You know, look, we're talking about empire. You know, I know people talk about the Spanish empire, and sometimes they feel like, well, man, we've got to apologize for the Spanish empire. Well, maybe we do have to apologize for the Spanish empire, but then you've got to apologize for every empire because we happen to be part of the greatest empire ever here in the United States. This is an empire. You know, this is an empire. You know, and what Carlos Fuentes says in there is, says, yeah, you know, the Spaniards gave us the Inquisition, but they also gave us Goya. You know, you know the Spaniards, you know, as he said, yeah, the Spaniards, you know, uh, you know gave us uh, Franco, but they also gave us five in the afternoon. I mean, the point is Mexico. 
he could no longer work in Mexico. He came to the University of Illinois. Well, I didn't know anything about this part, but as I was going through my doctoral stuff, you read stuff written by Mexicans, and they always talked about this guy, Armias, what he had done, and how much he had understood so much of the rise of Mesoamerican civilization. Well, look, I found I heard by accident that he was at the University of Illinois, so I, I got on the phone, because I needed somebody to tutor me. And I said, hey, I'm sorry, David Carrasco, can you know what he said? Are you, in his deep voice, are you related? To Pedro Carrasco? And I said, no, no, I, I know him, but I'm not, you know, I'm, not, I'm not related to Pedro Carrasco. He was another famous Mesoamerican. So I went over, and I persuaded him to tutor me. So we became, he, I used to go to his house all the time. He would tutor me. You know, Chicago had nobody working in Mesoamerica, Aztec civilization, because okay? they still had not been deprovincialized. What happened was I needed to go back to Mexico to do some research, and he wrote a letter to the up-and-coming Eduardo Matos Moctezuma, who had been his student. And I took this letter with me. I took this letter down, and I met Matos, and he read those. Mm, how come this big Chicano is showing up with a letter from the great Armias, you know, and so forth? So he gave me permission to go work at these archaeological zones, Teotihuacan, Tula, and so forth, and to go spend the night there. I wanted to see what it was like, because of my romantic, what it's like at night at these archaeological zones. I'll tell you, muchos moscos, the mosquitoes ate me up, and I'll tell you. So, so what happened was, he, he introduced me to Eduardo Matos. It was just a short meeting. And this is Eduardo Matos as a young archaeologist. So here you see him in Chiapas, and he's, you know, he's directing these workers, they're bringing this monument and so forth. So a Spaniard takes me to Mexico, um, and what happens is, uh, in 1978, there's this fabulous discovery in downtown Mexico City. I mean, it's a world-shaking discovery. Uh, and as a result of this discovery uh, of the great Coyoshalki stone, they begin to excavate the great Aztec temple, which is the equivalent of the Vatican of, of the Aztec world. Eduardo Matos is put in charge of it. He put in charge of the excavation. And as a result of his managing this excavation of the very center of the Aztec world, uh, he becomes a national treasure. You go to Mexico today, and you just, all my cab rides are free. Because I just tell them, I'm going to see Matos. And they say, Matos, oh no, we're going to give me a free cab ride. Um, because this is very interesting in terms of this point. One cab driver said to me about Matos, he showed us Mexicans who we are. Now, what I'm trying to say is this is the kind of power that uh, this archaeology had in Mexico you know, at the time. So what, what happened? Here's what happened. And so uh, they, they discovered in 1978, right here, in the road, underneath the road, behind the National Cathedral, they, they discover uh, the Coyoshauki stone. And here you see them, you see how the road curves? Because it's on top of an Aztec pyramid. And if you go over a, if you go over a, a block, it's the same thing. See how it's curved? And right there, and the, the electrical workers were putting lines underneath here, and they find this incredible, incredible Aztec monument. Talk about civilization, you know. Here it is. They find this thing, it's 12 feet across, and it's a dismembered goddess, beautifully carved, but encapsulated in this way. Here's her head, and so forth, just to give you a sense of the size of this thing. This is the size of, of what was found there. Um, and, um, you know, it was, on, it was on Walter Cronkite, it was all over the world, everybody knew about this, because, so I'm back in Mexico now, I'm back, and I become a part of this. Um, I'm back into this whole thing, back in the Zocalo. Uh, and here you see, um, you know, the blood flowing from the body of this, uh, of, this, uh, of this great figure. And Eduardo Matos is put in charge of it. And so what happens is I go back to Mexico, uh, living with my same aunt. She says, you go down and see Matos. I said, he's not going to remember me. So, oh no, he'll remember. You go down and see him. So I go down to the excavation. I'm standing at the fence, five deep. All the Mexicans are looking in because this is incredible news. They're finding all this material, this incredible stuff. And there's Matos. And I wanted to shout over the, hey, Matos, David Carrasco, you remember me? You know, and I, but I'm not going to do it because it's going to embarrass him. And if he says no, poof, it's all gone, see? So I, and I had this feeling, I had this feeling that, man, this is a moment for me. I'm at the University of Chicago. I'm writing about cities and symbols and Quetzalcoatl and the way religion plays. And here they found this thing in Mexico City. And so I got to get Matos' attention to see if he remembers me. It's now three years later. But I'm not going to yell over the fence because if it embarrasses him and he's going to say, "Well, can this thing? This thing is this the pocho que está por aquí?" No. So, 
Uh, no. So I went around. I looked around for a way to get his attention. I went around the back of the excavation area, and there in the back there were these trees. And these trees had these little guardias on. They had these little guardrails. I got up and <laughs> looked over the fence. And there's Matos right there where Luis is, right there. He's that close. I said, oh, man, now I can maybe get his attention. Maybe he'll remember me, you know, without embarrassing him. He's showing somebody the site. Just at that moment, over there, right just down there, you know, past where Paco is, somebody, for some reason they opened the gate. I don't know why they opened the gate. I ran down and I stood in the middle and I said, Eduardo, David Carrasco, no sé si me recuerdas. He said, David, I've been waiting for you. Come on in. He says, you know, I said, wow. He said, look, can you come back uh, Monday, 10 o'clock, because I want to talk to you about how we can work together in the future of this. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm free on Monday. I'm free on Monday. And even though yo no soy católico, I went over to the National Cathedral to thank the Virgen de Guadalupe, you know, forever. I said, I'll be, do anything you say for this opportunity. <laughs> so what happens is this becomes this moment of transition. Now you see the National Cathedral, here's the excavation, um, where Matos says to me, David, I want you to help me organize the future studies on the Eight Great Aztec Temple because I get calls all the time from these Chicanos who think that this somehow has something to do with them. They think Aslan is in Arizona. He said, we know, you know Aslan is you know, no, no further north than San Luis Potosí, but you know, maybe you can help us understand this. I want to know about the Mexican-Americans and why they identify so much with this. So we begin a partnership, Eduardo Matos and I begin a partnership to begin to organize an international group of scholars to study this, you know, this ghost. Here's where the great temple stood in relationship to Mexico City. So you see, as a kid, I'm over here in the Zocalo worrying about my identity. Here I am now invited to be a part of this uh, particular experience. So um, this Spaniard leads me to Matos, which leads me uh, to uh, this, this partnership. And, and what happens then is the formation of this research center, which is sort of my model. Here's a picture, I just took it last year, just last year, me and Matos. <laughs> Uh, um, and so what, what takes place then is he says, he, he and I come up with the following agreement, that we're going to form a long-term research center that's going to be multidisciplinary, and it's going to help us train students, and it's going to help us use these different disciplines to figure out what in the world the Aztecs were achieving in the creation of this empire that was based not only on religiosity, on violence and sexuality, very much like the Spanish Empire that comes. Um, and we're going to create a new body of knowledge, but we're going to do it in such a way that it achieves a couple of good goals. So we had six things in mind, but one of the purposes of, of this, uh, and Paco's going to help me uh, set up uh, this, uh, the website I want you to see. One of the things that, that Matos and I said clearly was, Look, David, he said, David, you know, the gringos in the United States have too much control over these studies. So what you and I are going to do as a Mexican-American, as a Mexican, we're going to get control of the way these studies are done in the United States, or we're going to influence how these studies are done in the United States. He said, because I want to work with you as a Mexican-American, and I want to make sure that the Mexican and the Mexican-American really direct how Aztec studies are done in the future. Um, and we created the archive. And the archive has seven major points. And I'm going to go through them quickly, and then we can have some discussion. So the first thing that we had to do was we wanted to create a collection of the it, the data, the images, and the texts, and the stories. And we had to create them. Uh, this organization of them and put them in a central location. And the central location was going to be where I was, which was the University of Colorado in Boulder at the time. Now, when they excavated the Great Aztec Temple, which still, by the way, is still going on, there was all this fabulous photograph photography was done. I mean, the National Geographic did a cover story on it. Uh, Time Magazine did a big story on it. And all these great photo photographers came down and took photographs, which the Mexicans then got control of, but they gave me a copy. So I would have a backup copy of all these photographs in case something happened to the archive in Mexico. That copy is here now at Harvard with me. I've had it with me for 30 years. When I was at Colorado, 
when I went to Princeton and here, I have the backup copy for what's in Mexico in case something were to happen to it. We also you know, collected all this, not only the pictorial material, but we then collected the best scholarship we could get in articles and in books. Uh, um, uh, and that became, I can tell you, a very potent collection because when Princeton came and recruited me, I said, well, I got me an archive and I'm not going anywhere without my archive. And they said, oh no, we want you because of the archive. <laughs> and so the archive went to Princeton with me and we set it up a, and it grew and grew. When Harvard came, they said, well, we want you because of the archive. So the archive is here now. The second thing, you know, was, you know, I had gone, it was so good about what Paco's done here. I had gone to these professional meetings, the American Academy of Religion, and I grew to detest them because it'd be 3,000 people and you go and you get in a room and you stand up for 20 minutes and give a talk and sit down. Somebody else doesn't, then they will go off and that's it. Maybe you have lunch. And I thought, man, this is a waste of time. I mean, this is okay, but you know, we're gonna have our own meetings. So we organized a group of meetings and each meeting would last a whole week. I would fly people from Mexico and from the US, sometimes from Japan to Boulder, Colorado, and we would stay for a week together and we would work. And people would have a whole morning to make your presentation. You'd make your presentation, there'd be a discussion, and then you'd do the next one, and people began to form really working relationships. We did this throughout, starting in 79. We did it at Colorado until I left in 92. Then when I went to Princeton, we did the same thing until I came here in 2001. And we had these meetings where people really got to spend time together. And that became that became really, let me get this thing here. <coughs> that became the archive. Let me show you some of the stuff in the people here. Yeah, here, here's a group of, of some of the people meeting uh, in Princeton. Um, we did some stuff here with Day of the Dead. Here we are on a field trip in Mexico. So one of the things that we did, we would take people also to Mexico. Here we are with a Nahuatl speaking family, it's still very Aztec, <coughs> who's teaching us about the cultivation of mezcal uh, and the cult cultivation of these materials because uh, in our group we had ethnobotanists and these ethnobotanists knew how today in Mexico the Aztec ethnobotany was still being carried on. So we also took uh, uh, people there. Um, what we decided we would do, and this is you know, the third point, the third point which is significant for me, and, and again, it was resonating with Luis's talk yesterday. You know, look, we're talking about empire. You know, I know people talk about the Spanish empire, and sometimes they feel like, well, man, we've got to apologize for the Spanish empire. Well, maybe we do have to apologize for the Spanish empire, but then you've got to apologize for every empire because we happen to be part of the greatest empire ever here in the United States. This is an empire. You know, this is an empire. You know, and what Carlos Fuentes says in there is, says, yeah, you know, the Spaniards gave us the Inquisition, but they also gave us Goya. You know, you know the Spaniards, you know, as he said, yeah, the Spaniards, you know, uh, you know gave us uh, Franco, but they also gave us five in the afternoon. I mean, the point is, all of these groups have this kind of complexity, and I, and I think that's really important, and the same thing is about the Aztecs. But the point I'm trying to make is, what we decided to do was to study the two things that really make Mexico and Mesoamerica stand out in terms of social transformations. And the first thing that makes Mexico stand out and Mesoamerica stand out is that it was one of the six areas in human history where people de develop cities sui generis. I mean, you want to know where great social change took place. It took place in northern China. It took place in Mesopotamia. It took place in the Indus Valley. You know, it, it took place in Egypt. It took place in Peru, and it took place in Mexico, where human beings were able to cooperate and compete with one another at such intensity that they invented an urban tradition. And so our work came to be, Hey man, how did this happen? 
what had to happen in Mexico and in Peru in order for people to invent basically the socially stratified world everybody lives in terms of now. They got this stupid word for it in terms of me, globalization. It's not globalization. It's social stratification worldwide. It's what Paul Wheatley called the ecumenopolis. And that started in Mexico. And when the Spaniards came with their empire, they ran into another empire. And that's the second thing that we decided to study, which was colonialism, the way in which colonialism transformed both of these empires. This became, uh, in a sense, uh, what it was, let me show you a little bit more here, what it was, <clears throat> I don't know, Paco, how this works here, this thing here. Let me see, maybe I got it now, hold on. There we are, young guys again, there we are. Now, um, so we studied the rise of cities, these empires, and also colonial history. And we were interested in what Carlos Fuentes had to say about our cultural heritage as descendants of Iberian indigenous African encuentros and the long event of colonialism. Now, I mentioned it a little bit during the previous presentation. One of the things that's important to me in the future period of time is this whole question of the anniversaries of 1517. The first Spanish expedition arrives in Mexico, goes up to Florida. 1518, the second one comes and they learn about the Aztec Empire. 1519, you know, well, look, we ought to be taking advantage of this. 2017, 2018, 2019, 2021, and using all of our resources to get places like Harvard and other places to pay attention to the fact that these are the anniversaries where the Western world really began to change. Because in 1517, there were two fantastic events that took place. One took place in in, in Wittenberg, Germany, when Martin Luther said, here I stand, and started the Protestant Reformation, same year, Spaniards show up in Mexico and say, here we land. Here we land. And that we and land became the history of the Americas from then on. So this seems to me to be a very important thing. The fifth point that uh, I wanted to mention, and I'm just coming to the end here, Paco. Um, let me just... <laughs> Bring this thing up here. The fifth point that was that we would try to develop, we would develop publications. Look, look at all the publications. These are the publications that our archive subsequently ended up publishing over this period of time with different presses. Here are just some of the others, just to run through it. And what we decided was that we would take this approach that I've told you about, Religionswissenschaft, the history of religions, and we would put it into a powerful dialogue with a bunch of other disciplines that tended to be skeptical of religion. Archaeology is really kind of skeptical of religion. I mean, they find religion everywhere, but they don't like to talk about it too much. You know, it's just a God, that God doesn't know his God. You know. We don't even know the God's name, but we'll put it in here in the museum and so forth. We don't know it's alive. You know, art history, art history. They like to do that stuff, but they don't want to talk too much about the religiosity of this stuff. So they like the idea that I came as a historian of religions. And so we put this kind of dialogue together. And as a result, you know, we ended up producing the Oxford Encyclopedia of Mesoamerican Cultures, which, um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, that encyclopedia ended up winning all the awards that could possibly be given. It won the 2001 Library Journal Best Reference Source, Book List, Editor's Choice, New York Public Library's Best Reference. And that came out of this archive of people. That was the point. Six. And I made this decision early on, and it really has stuck. And that is, the Mexicans were always were always in the front line of all of this. I absolutely made sure because when I was a graduate student, I did see that a number of Norte Americanos who were good scholars had gone to Mexico and gone to Guatemala and they'd spent some time down there and they had benefited from graduate students, Mexican and Guatemalan and other kind of graduate students. And they came up here and they made careers and names. And these people hardly, hardly existed in their reports and in their bibliographies. And excuse me, 
this pissed me off. And I made sure that from then on in our archive that the Mexicans were always going to be in the front line of this. And this was going to be used to help Mexican scholars and Mexican work be respected and known better in the United States. The seventh and final point, which is what I'm showing you here, is that we wanted to create a body of new knowledge for the next generation, um, for the next generation of people uh, who would be coming along. And so our approach was, you know, to try to use all of this as a kind of mirror and window, not only to show the present research and collaboration that could take place, but also as, as windows. And we could try to look out with more light at a wider landscape. Uh, and it's led to some good stuff. We've done all right. Um, and uh, you know, it's created a lot of good scholarship. And uh, here at Harvard, and this is my final point, we've formed a good relationship not only with the David Rockefeller Center, but with the Observatorio. Um, and in October, uh, we're going to be having our fifth big award ceremony um, in honor of Henry Nicholson, who I showed you earlier. Um, and we're bringing from Mexico um, the, the great Japanese archaeologist Saburo Sugiyama, uh, who's going to be receiving the H.B. Nicholson Award for Excellence in Mesoamerican Culture. So the people who won it so far, Eduardo Matos, Anthony Avini, Elizabeth Boone and Alfredo Lopez Austin. Um, and uh, it's all part uh, of this spirit uh, of the I, thou, and the it. So I, I wanted to, to sort of give that as a, a possibility for maybe some future things that might take place among us. Uh, and I want to thank you very much, Paco, uh, for inviting me to come and share my research center. Thank you. Yeah. This enthusiastic uh, lecture presentation. Now it's time for questions, for remarks, for comments. Can I ask how many items, or uh, it's just books, but you have maps also and mm -hmm. a different kind of stuff. Yeah, thank you. How, how many of yeah. them? Yeah. So the. Um, yeah, we have this photographic collection that I mentioned as a backup, and, and over the years we then began to collect um, as many excellent articles from all these different journals in Spanish, in Mexico, in the United States, Japan, that we could get. And we have a huge collection of those. And then the digital age has come along, and so we, we're, we're trying to get all those scanned. Um, then uh, we do have a botanical collection of, uh, um, you know, of, of different Aztec plants that the ethnobotanists have brought up. Uh, but about 10 years ago, uh, I was invited to uh, help decipher a, an Aztec era map, codex that had been lost and, uh, for many years. And we put together our team. We went to Mexico and we worked for five years deciphering the Mapa de Cuautin Chan, um, uh, which is, a, you know, it's, a, it's an incredible, uh, uh, it's, a, it's sort of the equivalent of the, of the Odyssey. It's, it's the great journey from the homeland uh, to, the, to the city of transformation uh, and then to a new homeland. It's all, it's got about 700 hieroglyphs uh, in it uh, and we publish that and we have copies of that uh, in the archive as well. So that's what, what you've seen and you've been a part of, yeah. Yeah. Congratulations, Professor. You said that Eduardo Matos, at the beginning, he wanted uh, an American university to direct the studies. Uh, what do you think it was in his, his purpose of doing that? And now it seems that you want the Mexicans, a uh, professor or academia, to be in the front line. So it seems contradictory yeah. to what was the, yeah. but I think it's, it's, it's very holistic, no? the whole view, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't say it right. He wasn't that he wanted an American university to direct the studies, he wanted the collaboration between himself and myself uh, to have, you know, a real influence in the future direction of Aztec studies. At that time, uh, you know, the universities that were in charge of really Aztec studies in this country uh, was Tulane University, uh, UCLA, uh, and of course Harvard's own uh, Dumbarton Oaks 
in Washington, D.C. Um, and there was very good scholars uh, at those places. Um, but, you know, Mexicans and the Mexican archaeologists were, I won't say they were not respected. I'm just saying they weren't, they weren't fully treated as colleagues. Um, and Matos saw that the collaboration that he had with me, first he felt he could trust me. And, and the idea was to make the University of Colorado a, a place where, uh, you know, Mexicans would come and, and be able to play a leadership role in every conference. Uh, so that was the idea, that they play a leadership role in every conference. Um, and eventually the people at UCLA and Tulane, they wanted to come work with us at Colorado. Uh, and that at first was hard for them because they thought they were the places where the center of the study should be done. But they eventually came and we all, they are now part of the archive. So the archive became a new center where the Mexican archeologists just had a leadership role and they didn't in the other places. So that was the idea. It was really a backup. Our collection's a backup in case there was a fire or there was a revolution or something happened at Ina and these materials were lost. The idea was that we would have a backup that we would give to Mexico. Um, so that's, uh, you know, I hope that's a little clearer. Is it still an issue? I mean, you still have a... No, 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 I think, yeah, that, but it seems now that you want also to, to the, the professors to be more involved in the front line now, no? So it has changed from the beginning till now, no, in a certain way, no? Well, the Mexican professors have always been in the front line, ah, is what I'm saying. Okay. From 19 in the beginning, when Matos came, from now on, Matos is in the front line. Um, yeah. Quería preguntarle, profe, si se han hecho excavaciones en América, en Norteamérica, eh, de donde los chicanos creen que es Aztlán. Eh, ¿Se han empezado excavaciones, se han hecho estudios donde se pueda... Ver si, uh -huh. si Aztlán pues todo, sí, hay, hay, hay algunas excavaciones en, en los Estados Unidos uh, que, que personas que, que crean que Aztlán está en Salt Lake City o está en, el, eh, pues en, en, en Texas. Pero estas excavaciones son privados de personas de veras que están un poco así, ¿no? Y, y que, y que me llaman, oye, profesor Carrasco, yo he encontrado el lugar donde está el tesoro de Moctezuma. Ah, pues, ¿dónde está? Pues está muy cerca de Austin, Texas. Pues cómo puede ser? Is all of these groups have this kind of complexity, and I, and I think that's really important. And the same thing is about the Aztecs. But the point I'm trying to make is, what we decided to do was to study the two things that really make Mexico and Mesoamerica stand out in terms of social transformations. And the first thing that makes Mexico stand out and Mesoamerica stand out is that it was one of the six areas in human history where people de developed cities sui generis. I mean, you want to know where great social change took place? It took place in northern China. It took place in Mesopotamia. It took place in the Indus Valley. You know, it, it took place in Egypt. It took place in Peru, and it took place in Mexico, where human beings were able to cooperate and compete with one another at such intensity that they invented an urban tradition. And so our work came to be, hey man, how did this happen? What had to happen in Mexico and in Peru in order for people to invent basically the socially stratified world everybody lives in terms of now? They got this stupid word for it in terms of me, globalization. It's not globalization, it's social stratification worldwide. It's what Paul Wheatley called the ecumenopolis. And that started in Mexico. And when the Spaniards came with their empire, they ran into another empire. And that's the second thing that we decided to study, which was colonialism, the way in which colonialism transformed both of these empires. This became, uh, in a sense, uh, what it was, let me show you a little bit more here, what it was, <clears throat> I don't know, Paco, how this works here, this thing here. Let me see. Maybe I got it now. Hold on. There we are. Young guys again. There we are. Now, um, so we studied the rise of cities, these empires, and also colonial history. 
And we were interested in what Carlos Fuentes had to say about our cultural heritage as descendants of Iberian, indigenous, African encuentros and the long event of colonialism. Now, I mentioned it a little bit during the previous presentation. One of the things that's important to me in the future period of time is this whole question of the anniversaries of 1517. The first Spanish expedition arrives in Mexico, goes up to Florida. 1518, the second one comes and they learn about the Aztec Empire. 1519, you know, well, look, we ought to be taking advantage of this. 2017, 2018, 2019, 2021, and using all of our resources to get places like Harvard and other places to pay attention to the fact that these are the anniversaries where the Western world really began to change. Because in 1517, there were two fantastic events that took place. One took place in, in, in Wittenberg, Germany, when Martin Luther said, here I stand, and started the Protestant Reformation. Same year, Spaniards show up in Mexico and say, here we land. Here we land, and that we and land became the history of the Americas from then on. So this seems to me to be a very important thing. The fifth point that I wanted to mention, and I'm just coming to the end here, Paco. Um, let me just bring this thing up here. The fifth point that was that we would try to develop we would develop publications. Look, look at all the publications. These are the publications that our archive subsequently ended up publishing over this period of time with different presses. Here are just some of the others just to run through it. And what we decided was that we would take this approach that I've told you about, Religions Wissenschaft, the history of religions, and we would put it into a powerful dialogue with a bunch of other disciplines that tended to be skeptical of religion. Archaeology is really kind of skeptical of religion. I mean, they find religion everywhere, but they don't like to talk about it too much. You know, it's just a God that God doesn't know his God. You know, we don't even know the God's name, but we'll put it in here in the museum and so forth. We don't know it's alive. You know, art history, art history, they like to do that stuff, but they don't want to talk too much about the religiosity of this stuff. So they like the idea that I came as a historian of religions. And so we put this kind of dialogue together. And as a result, you know, we ended up producing the Oxford Encyclopedia of Mesoamerican Cultures, which, um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, that encyclopedia ended up winning all the awards that could possibly be given. It won the 2001 Library Journal Best Reference Source book list, editor's choice, New York Public Library's best reference. And that came out of this archive of people. That was the point. Six. And I made this decision early on, and it really has stuck. And that is, the Mexicans were always, were always in the front line of all of this. I absolutely made sure, because when I was a graduate student, I did see that a number of Norte Americanos who were good scholars, had gone to Mexico and gone to Guatemala, and they'd spent some time down there, and they had benefited from graduate students, Mexican and Guatemalan and other kind of graduate students, and they came up here and they made careers and names, and these people hardly, hardly existed in their reports and in their bibliographies. And excuse me, this pissed me off. And I made sure that from then on in our archive that the Mexicans, we're always going to be in the front line of this. And this was going to be used to help Mexican scholars and Mexican work be respected and known better in the United States. The seventh and final point, which is what I'm showing you here, is that we wanted to create a body of new knowledge for the next generation, um, for the next generation of people uh, who would be coming along. And so our approach was, you know, to try to use all of this as a kind of mirror and window, not only to show the present research and collaboration that could take place, but also as, as windows. that we could try to look out with more light at a wider landscape. Uh, and it's led to some good stuff. We've done all right. Um, and uh, you know, it's created a lot of good scholarship. 
And uh, here at Harvard, and this is my final point, we've formed a good relationship, not only with the David Rockefeller Center, but with the Observatorio. Um, and in October, uh, we're going to be having our fifth big award ceremony um, in honor of Henry Nicholson, who I showed you earlier. Um, and we're bringing from Mexico um, the, the great Japanese archaeologist Saburo Sugiyama, uh, who's going to be receiving the H.B. Nicholson Award for Excellence in Mesoamerican Culture. So the people who won it so far, Eduardo Matos, Anthony Avini, Elizabeth Boone, and Alfredo Lopez Austin. Um, and uh, it's all part uh, of this spirit uh, of the I, thou, and the it. So I, I wanted to, to sort of give that as a, a possibility for maybe some future things that might take place among us. Uh, and I want to thank you very much, Paco, uh, for inviting me to come and share my research center. Thank you. Yeah. This enthusiastic uh, lecture presentation. Now it's time for questions, for remarks, for comments. Can I ask how many items, or uh, it's just books, but you have maps also and mm -hmm. a different kind of stuff. Yeah, thank you. How, how many of yeah. them? Yeah. So the. Um, yeah, we have this photographic collection that I mentioned as a backup, and, and over the years we then began to collect um, as many excellent articles from all these different journals in Spanish, in Mexico, in the United States, Japan, that we could get. And we have a huge collection of those. And then the digital age has come along, and so we, we're, we're trying to get all those scanned. Um, then uh, we do have a botanical collection of, uh, um, you know, of, of different Aztec plants that the ethnobotanists have brought up. Uh, but about 10 years ago, uh, I was invited to uh, help decipher a, an Aztec era map, codex that had been lost and, uh, for many years. And we put together our team. We went to Mexico and we worked for five years deciphering the Mapa de Cuautin Chan, um, uh, which is, a, you know, it's, a, it's an incredible, uh, it's, a, it's sort of the equivalent of the, of the Odyssey. It's, it's the great journey from the homeland uh, to, the, to the city of transformation uh, and then to a new homeland. It's all, it's got about 700 hieroglyphs uh, in it uh, and we publish that and we have copies of that uh, in the archive as well. So that's what, what you've seen and you've been a part of, yeah. Yeah. And congratulations, Professor. You said that the Eduardo Matos at the beginning, he wanted uh, an American university to direct the studies. Uh, what do you think it was in his, his purpose of doing that? And now it seems that you want the Mexicans uh, professor or academia to be in the front line. So it seems contradictory yeah. to what was the, yeah. but I think it's, it's, it's very holistic, no? the whole view, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't say it right. He wasn't that he wanted an American university to direct the studies, he wanted the collaboration between himself and myself uh, to have, you know, a real influence in the d future direction of Aztec studies. At that time, uh, you know, the universities that were in charge of really Aztec studies in this country uh, was Tulane University, uh, UCLA, uh, and of course Harvard's own uh, Dumbarton Oaks in Washington, D.C. Um, and there was very good scholars uh, at those places. Um, but, you know, Mexicans and the Mexican archaeologists were, I won't say they were not respected, I'm just saying they weren't, they weren't fully treated as colleagues. Um, and Matos saw that the collaboration that he had with me, first he felt he could trust me. And, and the idea was to make the University of Colorado a, a place where uh, you know, Mexicans would come and, and be able to play a leadership role in every conference. Uh, so that was the idea, that they play a leadership role in every conference. Um, and eventually the people at UCLA and Tulane, they wanted to come work with us at Colorado. Uh, and that at first was hard for them because they thought they were the places where the center of the study should be done. But they eventually came and we all, they are now part of the archive. So the archive became a new center where the Mexican archaeologists 
just had a leadership role and they didn't in the other places. So that was the idea. It was really a backup. Our collection's a backup in case there was a fire or there was a revolution or something happened at Ina and these materials were lost. The idea was that we would have a backup that we would give to Mexico. Um, so that's, uh, you know, I hope that's a little clearer. Is it still an issue? I mean, you still have a... No, 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 I think, yeah, that, but it seems now that you want also to, to the, the professors to be more involved in the front line now, no? So it has changed from the beginning till now, no, in a certain way, no? Well, the Mexican professors have always been in the front line, ah, what I'm saying. Okay. From 19, in the beginning, when Matos came, from now on, Matos is in the front line. Um, yeah. Profe, este teléfono no está, este micrófono no está. Ah, ah, ok, sí, perdón. <risa> Quería preguntarle, profe, si se han hecho excavaciones en América, en Norteamérica, eh, de donde los chicanos creen que es Aztlán. Eh, ¿Se han empezado excavaciones, se han hecho estudios donde se pueda ver si, uh -huh. si Aztlán pues, todo, sí, hay, hay, hay algunas excavaciones en, en los Estados Unidos, Uh, que, que personas que, que crean que Aslan está en Salt Lake City o está en, el, eh, pues en, en, en Texas. Pero estas excavaciones son privadas, de personas de veras que están un poco así, ¿no? Y, y que, y que me llaman, oye, profesor Carrasco, yo he encontrado el lugar donde está el tesoro de Moctezuma. Ah, pues, ¿dónde está? Pues está muy cerca de Austin, Texas. Pues, ¿cómo puede ser? No, no, porque yo puedo leer el, el, el paisaje aquí, hay una montaña que está mencionado en el Códice Mendoza, Mendocino, yo creo que está aquí cerca de Dallas. Ah, pues así, ah, pues ok, pues déjeme pensar. Eh, pasa dos, dos meses. Oye, profesor Carrasco, ¿por qué no está eh, dando atención a mi, mi descubrimiento? Ah, pues mira, estoy ocupado, mi amigo, pero tiene, tiene que hablar con Matos, mejor Matos. So, eh, los, los únicos excavaciones en, en la donde viven la, la chicanada, son así. Los chicanos no están excavando, pero hay unos chicanos que dicen que en unos mapas del siglo XVII hay referencias a Aslan y tiene que estar muy cerca de Salt Lake City, porque hay siete cuevas allá. Entonces, algo así, pero no. Porque Aslan es como un lugar mítico, ¿no? De donde el nacimiento de la, de la raza. Hay, hay muchos eh, este, testimonios en los códices sobre Aslan o Chico Mostoc. Algunas veces hay siete cuevas, otros son cinco cuevas, otros ocho cuevas. Y en México hay muchas cuevas. Entonces, así es, ¿ok? Bueno, pues si no nos preguntas, vamos a enlazar. A ver si por ahí. Thank you very much for the presentation. I found it personally inspiring. And so I just have a quick question. Um, to what extent does the archive possess materials related to the Mayan civilization? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. So, uh, to go back to, to the question of when we did this encyclopedia, I showed you the encyclopedia. So what happened was as a result of this, of this collaboration with the Mexican scholars, and that collaboration that ended up embracing all of these people from Tulane and they became a part of the archive while carrying on their stuff. You know, I mean, at the beginning of this, people at Dumbarton Oaks would never have thought of inviting me to one of their conferences. In fact, they, they, made, an, they made a point of not inviting me, see, because I was at Colorado and I was, you know. So Mato said, well, we're going to have conferences where they're going to want to come. So we had our conferences and then they started coming to our conferences, see? okay? So, um, Uh, there, there was always uh, this sense uh, of exclusion that led to a kind of inclusion. And what was the other part of your question? The, the Maya, yeah. Okay, oh yeah, so what happened was, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so what happened was the Oxford Encyclopedia came and said, hey, David, we would like you to be the editor-in-chief. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, but as long as I can put my editorial board, and I'm going to have it very strong on the Mexican side. He said, fine, you can do that. So I talked to Matos, Alfredo Lopez Austin, uh, Armias was alive at the time, other people, uh, Leon Portilla, and we lined them up as the, as the, as the editors mm -hmm. of this thing. But the problem in this country, and this is really good about your question, is that 
the Mayan scholarship in the United States is almost completely run by gringos. Mm. All right? And the problem with the Maya scholarship, which is very good, they got really good people, is that they had a problem developing alliances in Mexico with people. So much so that some of these leading scholars in the United States have been very negative about some of the Mexicans who had made the major discoveries in the Maya, especially at Palenque. I mean, attacks on the people who discovered the, the tomb of Pacal. So much so that the Mexicans, if you look at Maya scholarship, up until recently, you don't find too many Mexicans or Guatemalans in the forefront of Mayan scholarship. So the problem became for me, well, who am I going to get as the person who will do the Maya side of the Oxford Encyclopedia? So I went to my team and they said, well, there's only one guy. And his name is William Fash. And he's at Harvard. Because this guy relates to the Mayan scholars the way you relate to the Mexican scholars. He has a partnership with them. He doesn't play stratified games with them. So I called up Bill Fash, who I didn't know. And he was like, bro, let's do it. <laughs> and so he became, he's at Harvard here, he became in charge of the Maya side of that encyclopedia. And we had tremendous, tremendous success because he persuaded these other, he could persuade the other Mayan scholars, hey man, join up or you're going to be left out. See? So here at the Peabody Museum, when I arrived, there's already a Maya lab. Mm -hmm. It's called the Mesoamerican lab, and they already have an incredible amount of Maya material with Barbara and Bill Fash leading it. So I don't need to have Maya stuff in mind. They're just down the hall, and we collaborate. Uh, and Fash, if you look at the thing, his name is all throughout that. He, he, we, we had a great time working together. And, and subsequently, I was recruited to Harvard. Okay. You know, it all goes back to that Spaniard, Pedro Armias. <coughs> Just a quick uh, question and comment. My, I'm, as you know, I'm, I'm Mexican, and, but my Aztec moment came up when, when I read uh, Leon Portilla and I discovered Tlacaelel. So I don't know if you have information about that. I, in fact, it was so powerful, the pow the char that character, when I read it and, mm -hmm. and I started research. So I ended up in, a, in my thesis for my undergrad. So, uh, but I want to know if you have information about this character because it's still mm -hmm. a question in my head. So tell them what, tell them who Tlacalel is. Well, <laughs> he was he was the, the consejero. I don't know how to yeah. translate the consejero for sev six or seven. Right? Sorry, I I don't have it right now in my That's head. Right. It, it, I wrote it many years ago. Six or seven uh, Tlatuanis, which are the kings of the Aztecs. Azteca uh, Imperio. So, but because of him, according to my research, because of him, the Azteca power, the Azteca empire, se convirtió en un imperio. Yeah. Si, no hubiera, eh, si no hubiera existido Tlacaelel, mm -hmm. no habría existido el imperio Azteca. Mm -hmm. Porque gracias a este, a este consejo de guerra, eh, logró que eh, los diversos tlatoanis fueran, fueran empa, eh, empoderándose, fueran construyendo la, la pirámide de Tenochti, de Sí, el Templo Mayor. El Templo Mayor, lo fueran agrandando, fuera, o sea, si no, de acuerdo a la investigación, si no hubiera sido por Tlacael, el, sí, el imperio bien. azteca probablemente no hubiera sido so, tan poderoso. Well, so, great question. So, quickly, here's what happens. Uh, you know, the Aztec Empire, you know, really only lasts about a hundred years. You know, it really rises in the 1420s when it leads an alliance against the previous empire in the Valley of Mexico. Um, and it forms a triple alliance with the Aztec of Tenochtitlan in charge of the other city-states in the Valley of Mexico. And from then on, all of the Aztec Tlatoanis are from the same family. It's all one family. It's like, you know, it's kind of like, is it going to be the Clintons or the Bushes? I mean, who knows <laughs> what's it going to be, you know? Um, it's all families. All, every one of the Aztec rulers is from the same family. It's either a nephew, a brother, uh, you know, a cousin. They're all in the same family. And what happens is the Aztec world is a dual, dualistic world. There's always two in balance. So this, there's always a vice president, mm -hmm. this consejero. Mm -hmm. And the consejero who, who lasts, <laughs> outlasts all the Tlatuanis is this Tlacalele. He's the one. And he develops, a, you know, a real 
political sense. He's like the Henry Kissinger of uh, you know, the Aztec world. And he's the one who designs, as all these changes taking place, he designs this military campaign policy that the first Moctezuma, the first Moctezuma is really when the Aztec Empire really expands. Uh, and he lasts almost all the way to the end. This Tlaxcala, he lives you know, until he's like 80 years old. And he is this power behind the throne. Yes. Uh, you know, so there's a, there's a lot about him that uh, we have to learn. So thank you for the question. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You did your thesis on Tlaxcalele. Yeah. yeah. Bueno, le damos otra vez entonces las gracias. Sí, 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 sí. Con esto terminamos el simposio. Eh, quiero darles las gracias a todos por su participación, por el esfuerzo que han hecho para estar aquí durante estos días, sobre todo en, eh, con, unos, con un tiempo tan, tan estupendo. Y en vez de declarar eh, clausurado este simposio, lo que vamos a hacer es declarar inaugurado el simposio del año que viene. Así que lo, lo esperamos dentro de un año porque nuestra intención es, es repetir la experiencia. ¿de acuerdo? Nos pondremos en contacto con ustedes para la, para la publicación, como hablamos el primer día. Muchas gracias otra vez. No, no, porque yo puedo leer el, el, el paisaje aquí, hay una montaña que está mencionado en el Códiz Mendoza, Mendocino, yo creo que está aquí cerca de Dales. Ah, pues así, ah, pues ok, pues déjeme pensar. Eh, pasa dos, dos meses. Oye, profesor Carrasco, ¿por qué no está eh, dando atención a mi, mi descubrimiento? Ah, pues mira, estoy ocupado, mi amigo, pero tiene, tiene que hablar con Matos, mejor Matos. So, eh, los, los únicos excavaciones en, en la donde viven la, la chicanada, son así. Los chicanos no están excavando, pero hay unos chicanos que dicen que en unos mapas del siglo XVII hay referencias a Aslan y tiene que estar muy cerca de Salt Lake City, porque hay siete cuevas allá. Entonces, algo así, pero no. Porque Aslan es como un lugar mítico, ¿no? De donde el nacimiento de la, de la raza. Hay, hay muchos eh, este, testimonios en los códices sobre Aslan o Chico Mostoc. Algunas veces hay siete cuevas, otros son cinco cuevas, otros ocho cuevas. Y en México hay muchas cuevas. Entonces, así es, ¿ok? Bueno, pues si no nos preguntas, vamos a enlazar. A ver si por ahí. Thank you very much for the presentation. I found it personally inspiring. And so I just have a quick question. Um, to what extent does the archive possess materials related to the Mayan civilization? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. So, uh, to go back to, to the question of when we did this encyclopedia, I showed you the encyclopedia. So what happened was as a result of this, of this collaboration with the Mexican scholars, and that collaboration that ended up embracing all of these people from Tulane and they became a part of the archive while carrying on their stuff. You know, I mean, at the beginning of this, people at Dumbarton Oaks would never have thought of inviting me to one of their conferences. In fact, they, they, made, an, they made a point of not inviting me, see, because I was at Colorado and I was, you know. So Mato said, well, we're going to have conferences where they're going to want to come. So we had our conferences and then they started coming to our conferences, see? okay? So, um, uh, there, there was always uh, this sense uh, of exclusion that led to a kind of inclusion. And what was the other part of your question? The, the Maya, yeah. Okay, oh yeah, so what happened was, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so what happened was the Oxford Encyclopedia came and said, hey, David, we would like you to be the editor-in-chief. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, but as long as I can put my editorial board, and I'm going to have it very strong on the Mexican side. He said, fine, you can do that. So I talked to Matos, Alfredo Lopez Austin, uh, Armias was alive at the time, other people, uh, Leon Portilla, and we lined them up as the, as the, as the editors mm -hmm. of this thing. But the problem in this country, and this is really good about your question, is that the Mayan scholarship in the United States is almost completely run by gringos, mm -hmm. all right? And the problem with the Maya scholarship, which is very good, they got really good people, is that they had a problem 
developing alliances in Mexico with people. So much so that some of these leading scholars in the United States have been very negative about some of the Mexicans who had made the major discoveries in the Maya, especially at Palenque. I mean, attacks on the people who discovered the, the tomb of Pacal. So much so that the Mexicans, if you look at Maya scholarship, up until recently, you don't find too many Mexicans or Guatemalans in the forefront of Mayan scholarship. So the problem became for me, well, who am I going to get as the person who will do the Maya side of the Oxford Encyclopedia? So I went to my team and they said, well, there's only one guy. And his name is William Fash. And he's at Harvard. Because this guy relates to the Mayan scholars the way you relate to the Mexican scholars. He has a partnership with them. He doesn't play stratified games with them. So I called up Bill Fash, who I didn't know. And he was like, bro, let's do it. <laughs> and so he became, he's at Harvard here, he became in charge of the Maya side of that encyclopedia. And we had tremendous, tremendous success because he persuaded these other, he could persuade the other Mayan scholars, hey man, join up or you're going to be left out. See? So here at the Peabody Museum, when I arrived, there's already a Maya lab. It's called the Mesoamerican Lab, and they already have an incredible amount of Maya material with Barbara and Bill Fash leading it. So I don't need to have Maya stuff in mind. They're just down the hall, and we collaborate. Uh, and Fash, if you look at the thing, his name is all throughout that. He, he, we, we had a great time working together. And, and subsequently, I was recruited to Harvard. Okay. You know, it all goes back to that Spaniard, Pedro Armias. <coughs> Just a quick uh, question and comment. My, I, you know, my, my, I'm Mexican, and, but my Aztec moment came up when, when I read uh, Leon Portilla and I discovered Tlacaelel. So I don't know if you have information about that. I, in fact, it was so powerful, the pow the char that character, when I read it and mm -hmm. I started research. So I ended up in, a, in my thesis for my undergrad. So, uh, but I want to know if you have information about this character because it's still mm -hmm. a question in my head. So tell them what, tell them who Tlacalel is. Well, <laughs> he was, he was the, the consejero, I don't know how to yeah. translate the consejero for sev six or seven, right? Sorry, I, I don't have it right now in That's my right. head. It, it, I wrote it many years ago. Six or seven uh, Tlatuanis, which are the kings of the Aztecs. Azteca uh, Imperio. So, but because of him, according to my research, because of him, the Azteca power, the Azteca empire, se convirtió en un imperio. Yeah. Si, no hubiera, eh, si no hubiera existido Tlacaelel, mm -hmm. no habría existido el imperio Azteca. Mm -hmm. Porque gracias a este, a este consejo de guerra, eh, logró que eh, los diversos tlatoanis fueran, fueran empa, eh, empoderándose, fueran construyendo la, la pirámide de, de Tenochtitl, de, sí, el templo mayor, el templo mayor lo fueran agrandando, fuera, o sea, si no, de acuerdo a la investigación, si no hubiera sido por Tlacaelel, sí, el sí, imperio sí. azteca probablemente no hubiera sido so, tan poderoso. Well, so, great question. So quickly, here's what happens. Uh, you know, the Aztec Empire, you know, really only lasts about a hundred years. You know, it really rises in the 1420s when it leads an alliance against the previous empire in the Valley of Mexico. Um, and it forms a triple alliance with the Aztec of Tenochtitlan in charge of the other city-states in the Valley of Mexico. And from then on, all of the Aztec Platoanis are from the same family. It's all one family. It's like, you know, it's kind of like, is it going to be the Clintons or the Bushes? I mean, who knows <laughs> what's it going to be, you know? Um, it's all families. All, every one of the Aztec lords is from the same family. It's either a nephew, a brother, uh, you know, a cousin. They're all in the same family. And what happens is the Aztec world is a dual, dualistic world. There's always two in balance. So this, there's always a vice president, mm -hmm. this consejero. Mm -hmm. And the consejero who, who lasts, outlasts all the Tlatuanis is this Tlacalele. He's the one. And he develops a, you know, a real political sense. He's like the Henry Kissinger of uh, you know, the Aztec world. And he's the one who designs, as all these changes taking place, he designs this military campaign policy that the first Moctezuma, the first Moctezuma is really when the Aztec empire really expands 
Uh, and he lasts almost all the way to the end. This Tlacalel, he lives, you know, until he's like 80 years old. And he is this power behind the throne. Yeah. Uh, you know, so there's a, there's a lot about him that uh, we have to learn. So thank you for the question. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You did your thesis on Tlacalel. Yeah. yeah. Bueno, le damos otra vez entonces las gracias. Sí, 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 sí. Con esto terminamos el simposio. Eh, quiero darles las gracias a todos por su participación, por el esfuerzo que han hecho para estar aquí durante estos días, sobre todo en, eh, con, unos, con un tiempo tan, tan estupendo. Y en vez de declarar eh, clausurado este simposio, lo que vamos a hacer es declarar inaugurado el simposio del año que viene. Así que lo, lo esperamos dentro de un año porque nuestra intención es, es repetir la experiencia. ¿De acuerdo? Nos pondremos en contacto con ustedes para la, para la publicación, como hablamos el primer día. Muchas gracias otra vez. Gracias.